This time we've got a couple of questions that are pretty close to each other, so I've rolled into one, and both refer to the Herculaneum papyri that they are um, making some progress with uh, deciphering them. Um, there's been considerable progress in deciphering ancient texts, whether papyrus or on writing tablets, um, ostraca, that sort of thing, in recent years because of technology, the, you know, the great ability of, of photographing and scanning more precisely so you can start to see faint scratches that would not otherwise be visible and work out more of the letters. Now, this is very exciting and it will be fascinating just to see what they get because it's the same as when you know the Oxyrhynchus historian turned up on a papyrus from Oxyrhynchus in Egypt that was um, you know otherwise unknown um, suddenly we get an extra source for a period now it, he hasn't solved all the problems of later fifth early fourth century BC Greece but it, it's it's useful you know there are some extra bits and pieces things we wouldn't have come across otherwise things that make us question what we've got. In the case of the Herculaneum papyri, it's very hard to know um, what's actually there and what might be there and in a fit state that's sufficient of it can be deciphered to make some sort of sense because some of these documents almost certainly you'll get some fragments uh, that might be a few words, might be a few lines, might be more than that, but probably won't be the whole thing. Uh, anyway, it's you know more power to their elbow. It's remarkable stuff. Let's 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 wait and see. Um, part of the question was what would I most like um, to be discovered or rediscovered, um, and there are quite a few things. But it, it might be worth thinking in the first place of how we get the sources that we possess, like Herodotus, Thucydides, Tacitus, Caesar's Commentary, Cicero's Letters, Ammianus Marcellinus, poetry like Virgil, Ovid, you know, all, all of this sort of thing. How does it reach us? Because very rarely do we actually have an ancient text, a papyrus scroll, with the text of this particular author. In most cases, the earliest surviving manuscript is medieval. And this is because this is obviously the time before printing presses, so any document, any whether it's, it's legal, private, or a work of literature, has to be copied out by hand, letter by letter, page by page. That takes a lot of time. It requires um, scribes that are willing to copy this, and obviously there's a danger, and this is something that concerns many um, scholars when they analyze the text, that the, the text may be corrupted in the sort of you know, Chinese whispers things of um, as it's passed on, that gradually errors occur because somebody's not quite paying attention. We've all probably written notes or written something down, we've got something wrong. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if in some of these questions that I've posted up with each of these these videos and giving the answers that there'll be cases where um, I put a letter typo get through, either one I've put in or one that was there in the original and neither the person who wrote it nor me when I've come to it, we haven't noticed this. So, and I've I've yet to op have a book fall open when it's newly arrived and not see a typo on the first page that comes open. And that's when I've read it a lot of times. I've gone through it checking for this sort of thing. It's been through editors. It's been through proofreaders. Uh, it's been through friends who've read the thing. And we've all missed this because your your mind tends to run ahead when you're reading a, a, a text and you, you've already got the sense. So you fill in the gaps. You think you know what it means. Um, it's particularly a problem with copying numbers, that they're very easy to get wrong, because unless you're thinking about what does this actually mean. So manuscripts survive because they've been copied and they've been copied again and again and again. And then they had to be preserved somewhere to reach this archive in the Middle Ages. Mostly they're preserved by the church and they end up in monastic libraries because the church is trying to preserve literacy and as well as um, religious theological works, the importance of Greek for, obviously it's the language of the New Testament, the importance of Latin for the language of the church, means that they preserve a lot of ancient literature because it's considered to be good examples of how you write, uh, you know, how the language works, this sort of thing. Um, however, many things were then only gradually rediscovered, and it's part of the development towards the Renaissance, where works like Tacitus, um, his books were only discovered, things like the Germania, quite late in the, the very end of the medieval period, beginning of the early modern period, and they're influential in the 
sense of German identity, which is a factor within Martin Luther's um, movement, the sense that you're you're not just doing things because this is theologically right, but also it's there's a sense that as Germans you can do something different from people elsewhere. And you know the ideas from Tacitus Germani have part of a role in that. Um, but everything had to be copied. Being copied was expensive, it was time consuming, so there were there was always a limit to the numbers of these books that would be around, um, copies of the, the famous works we have. There's also then the risk that they're going to be destroyed by accident, you know, they're going to be um, get damp and soaked and decay that way, uh, particularly when you get them to collected lots of books collected in a monastic library, where again you've got monks writing out letter by letter, copying these things into books from scrolls into books and then different versions of the books, illuminating the manuscripts, all this sort of thing, you know, the Notitia Dignitatum, all this sort of thing is in medieval copies with all these nice little pictures and someone's copied the Roman shield devices, though some of them it's clearly, you know, they seem to have got bored and just doing it quickly, or someone at some stage and then the ones who copy that, that copy of it only have that to go on. They don't know what the original was and it's so distant to them in time they have no real concept of what it actually meant. So things can get distorted but they can also catch fire. You know, libraries are um, extremely susceptible to this sort of thing and if they go up an awful lot of things can go up very quickly. So whilst you know, famously people talk about the, um, the library in Alexandria, the part of which or part of its archive was burned during the fighting in Caesar's day and then later on in late antiquity which deliberately burned the loss of a lot of knowledge of a lot of texts on those occasions there are probably lots of less famous occasions where we've lost quite a bit as well um, and you know on the one hand until this technology becomes available you would think of scrolls that are in a house that's been buried by ash from a um, volcanic eruption in, you know, of um, Vesuvius that buries Herculaneum. Um, that's obviously that you would consider that lost to uh, posterity because of that. In fact, some of it we might now be able to decipher. So we have a tiny, tiny fraction of the literature that once existed. And that's not just true of the sort of mundane, everyday private letters, accounts of businesses, personal accounts, pay records, bureaucracy of the Roman army where they're moving around and tracing where men are, where mules are, uh, horses, all of this sort of thing. All of that stuff that we get fragments in, in writing tablets in Vindolanda Carlisle, in papyri from Masada, from Egypt, Ostraca from North Africa, you know, things written, and elsewhere. Things that have cropped up in various sites around the Roman Empire that gives us a glimpse of a far, far more extensive body of written material. It's also true of the works of comparatively famous and famous authors on the ancient world. Very often our authors will refer to, Plutarch will mention earlier historians, biographers whose works have not survived. Um, some of Cicero's works have not survived, some of his speeches, some in fragments, some not at all. Um, there were in antiquity collections of letters between Cicero and Pompey and Cicero and Caesar, Cicero and Octavian, the young Augustus, um, among others that have not survived. They were around, they were referred to in the first century AD, but they haven't reached us. So they've gone at some point, they've been lost at some point, more probably by accident than someone deliberately deciding I'm not going to copy this anymore. Certain things get copied more and more. There were more copies of certain works in the first place than um, others, therefore there's more chance of those surviving. Technical manu manuals tend to have a fairly poor survival rate. Um, so you've got Vegetius, and there's a question about him, and I'll talk about him in another uh, answer session. Um, thank you, Gussie. I think the cat's joining in from the, um, the corridor outside. Um, Yep, there he goes again. So um, Augustus the cat is contributing far more sensible comments than I ever manage um, with that rasping meow of a Berman. Um, certain things, like Virgil's Aeneid, there were going to be vast numbers of copies of that knocking around. It, it's quite interesting that there's a writing tablet from Vindlanda and there's a papyrus from Masada from the Roman occupation after the, the siege and fall of the, the fortress both of which somebody has sort of scrawled a line of Virgil's Aeneid. 
um, on the back, almost as a doodle or as a writing exercise or something like that. And it was particularly the first few books of the Aeneid, most of the quotes from the Aeneid, that it's, you know, it's one of the most frequently quoted works of Latin literature, they come from the early books, because that's probably the equivalent of what you did at school. So in the same way today, the same Shakespeare plays tend to get set very often for, for children in school, so more people are familiar with them to some extent. It's happening in the ancient world in their education system as well. You know, the Virgil's Aeneid is out there, but not everybody reads all of it uh, or is familiar with all of it. Um, but again, it's, it's uh, an interesting, as, a, as an aside, I won't go into this, this in detail today, but when you get all these arguments about the datings of you know, the Gospels and New Testament books, um, going back to the earliest papyrus record of this, most Roman sources, we'd, we'd, most Roman literature, we'd date to far later than it really was if we relied on that. So, you know, the, the, that line from Masada, written at Masada, the one written at Vindlanda, those are the earliest physical evidence for the text of the Aeneid. Um, and they're nearly a century after Virgil wrote the book. So um, it's just a, just a reminder of how little survives from the ancient world, how much there is we don't know. And in many cases, we know that a lot of books existed because we hear their titles and we hear that people in the ancient past refer, uh, refer to them as just they, they haven't survived into the modern world. So to come round to one of the other parts of the question of what would I love them to discover at Herculaneum or elsewhere, um, there's a few things. I mean, part of the archive, one of the main collections they've got comes from a villa owned earlier on by Calpurnius Piso, who was the father-in-law of Julius Caesar. He's the father of Calpurnia. I mean, you can get her in Shakespeare's play, Caesar's wife. Um, well, his, his uh, last wife, the one he, he's, he's married to when he's murdered. Wouldn't it be marvellous to have some private family correspondence, just letters talking about, you know, Calpurnius Piso writing to Caesar and back and forth, or even, you know, wouldn't that be wonderful, a letter written by a Roman, Roman woman from the aristocracy talking about life as Caesar's wife, um, and particularly in all those long years when she's there in Rome and Caesar's not, he's off in Gaul. To what extent is she running the family business in terms of trading favours and all this sort of thing? So you'd love that, you'd love the sort of personal detail you sometimes get from Cicero's letters and the precision of, oh, I'm in this place on this date which would help just to fill in some of the details. So personal stuff would be lovely, um, but so far it's, you know, it, it's more philosophical um, that, that's coming out because of course this is the, the library, the archive of uh, an educated member of Rome's elite who it would be, um, if my house was buried by um, ash and a couple of thousand years, people are starting to decipher the contents of my bookshelves they would find an awful lot of military history, an awful lot of ancient history, an awful lot of the sort of novels that I like to read. They wouldn't necessarily find a, a representative um, selection of the books that are most popular in Britain today. Um, they wouldn't find much that was terribly useful for reconstructing the politics of Britain today. Um, and they'd, you know, probably be complaining, why is this damn man have all this stuff about the Romans and the Greeks and this <laughs> and the ancient Germans when we want to know something useful about his time, not the time 2,000 years before his life that, okay, he's only guessing about this anyway. Um, so that would be nice. Um, when it comes to works that we know existed uh, that haven't survived, those ones are collections of letters from Cicero that I mentioned, the ones to Caesar, the ones to Pompey, the ones to Augustus. I mean, those would be marvellous to have, uh, having written about those years in particular. It would be marvellous just to get a more sense, because when you, you're reading somebody's own words, you get a sense of their character, their personality, and particularly in an informal letter, even if it is fairly staged, and these are people who are always politicking with each other and never quite telling the truth, you know, big smiles and, oh, I missed you so much, you're my greatest friend, and all this sort of thing, but by the way, I might have you executed next week. Um, it would still give a flavour, give a sense. And one of the intriguing things that you, you get a bit from Cicero, it's always interesting to know what's making people laugh at the time. What are the jokes? What are the gossip? What are the scandals? It, it gives you a sense of their, their interests, their priorities. And it, again, it's just very human. So that would be nice. Um, I think probably top of my list otherwise, which they're not going to find in Herculaneum because it wasn't written till after the eruption of Vesuvius. I would love to have, if it could turn up somewhere, the Emperor Trajan's commentaries on the Dacian Wars, 
because we have Trajan's column, we have this great spiral of sculptures showing scenes of the Roman army advancing, building camps, fighting battles, besieging cities, what the Dacians are up to, all of this sort of thing. And we know that Trajan wrote his own version, and it does seem, you know, there's a pretty good case to be made that the column would no doubt have reflected that version very strongly. Perhaps no more authentically than films based on memoirs or particular books take historical examples of somebody's opinion and then weave a story around it. But nevertheless, there'd be at least a, you feel a, a sort of basis, give us an idea, because otherwise we can't really interpret a lot of those sculptures in a way we'd like to, because we don't have places, times, identities of people, this sort of thing, motivations, what's explanation of what's going on. We've just got the pictures. A single line of Trajan's commentary survives when it's, um, it's quoted in a grammatical text to sort of explain a usage of words. Um, so we know it was there. It would be very interesting because the thing is, we only have Caesar's commentaries and we don't have um, anything by way of comparison to know were all Roman military commentaries written in that way? When, did, when a Roman commander sat down to write an account of his wars, was that how he did it? Was that the style? Did he always go third person? Um, was it the same sort of dispassionate um, account, but with uh, but aren't I great? Um, all of it would be fascinating in a more general sense. It would also be something that would tell us in the same sort of detail as Caesar, hopefully, how the Roman army, the Principate, the Imperial army we know so well from archaeology and we're used to seeing in part inspired by the images of Trajan's column, reconstructed by the, the reenactment groups and this sort of thing, how that actually worked on campaign and in battle, because we don't have detailed accounts of it fighting battles. We have to assume that a lot of things are the same. We've got things like Arian's battle order against the Alans, um, but it's, you know, it's it, how much is that tailored to a specific tactical situation? How far is that an example of how, in general, Roman army tactics and doctrines are changing? There are differing views on that. So that would be lovely to have. Ones they might just be able to sneak into the, the timeline given the date of the eruption. Um, also dealing with commentaries, Vespasian and Titus both wrote commentaries of the war in Judea. Uh, Josephus refers to them in one of his texts, um, that he's used them to show, you know, this is why I'm reliable, this is why I'm authentic. That would be fascinating to have. We've got Josephus' account, which is the fullest account of the Roman Imperial Army on campaign, but nevertheless, um, you know, it would be nice to have a different take on what the Romans thought about this. And again, the sort of the official version from a Roman perspective that might tell you, particularly people like myself who are interested in the army, just how it's doing things, how it's working, might explain some of the problems and questions we've got. And again, also give us an idea of just how similar to Caesar's commentaries were commentaries in general. So that would be wonderful. And, you know, that's just about possible. Don't think terribly likely, but it's possible. Um, Beyond that, another one that, again, wouldn't be possible because of the timing. Tacitus, we have the annals, we have the histories, but substantial parts of both of them are missing. So we don't get his account of Caligula's reign or all of Claudius's reign. We don't get his account of the invasion of Britain in 43, uh, not in the annals, it's presumably fuller. Um, we don't get... Um, in the histories, they stop, they basically deal, they stop in AD 70. So they deal with the civil war, year of four emperors after the death of Nero. They cover the Batavian revolt, but they don't cover its end. A little bit about Jerusalem, but they don't then go on to those decades of Flavian rule. It'd be nice to know more about Vespasian, Titus and Domitian. It would be marvelous to know more about what's going on in the provinces, particularly on the Danube with Dacia, the big defeat suffered by um, Domitian's army at, um, under Cornelius Fuscus at uh, Tapai. And um, you know, it's interesting that there's a quote from, I think it's Orosius writing later on, one of the Christian apologists, where he says that Tacitus didn't mention uh, the casualty figure for one of these disasters in Dacia because it was too depressing. And that, that's quite interesting. So with Tacitus, you wouldn't get as much detail, but we'd have far more about periods that, again, archaeologically are quite well represented and are interesting, and particularly from how the empire works, how the army works, but are not recorded. 
So that would be marvellous to have. Uh, from earlier on, there are so many things where you know, Velius Paterculus wrote more. Um, Pliny the Elder wrote about the German wars. Again, that would be marvellous. Dio Cassius, you have only the epitome of much of his work. So we'd like to have that. We'd like, you know, the satirist Lucian mocked many of the um, fawning accounts of Lucius Verus's Parthian War, but it would be rather nice to have them um, and compare them to them rather than just the bits that he decides are funny. And the, presumably there were other that were a little bit more sober that came out as well. A good account of Roman campaign against the Parthians, and that's before you get into late antiquity and all that's happening in the third century. So there are so many things it would be marvellous to have. Another one where we've got some of it, but not all, be nice to have the rest of Polybius. Be nice to have even the rest of Livy. Um, you know, he stops before he gets into some of the really exciting stuff in the later second and first centuries BC. Have Livy on the Gracchi, for instance, Livy on Marius, um, Livy on Sulla and the Civil Wars, all of the, this sort of thing. We've got epitomes of his books that have survived, the, the sort of summaries that came at the, the start of them in some of these collections. But you know, this, that's just tantalizing. So there is so much out there, and that's before we get onto the things that we suspect existed but um, that haven't survived. So accounts written by people who weren't senators but were Roman army officers, this sort of thing. That, that, that would be marvellous. But um, I think we've just got to be realistic about this, hope for the best, be pleased at any new discovery, even if often you know, a lot of the stuff, not particularly my cup of tea, not particularly my main interest, but the more we get, the more it will fill in our sense of the ancient world and people's thoughts, people's ideas. So, uh, you know, I might not get too excited about Epicurean philosophy and the like, but nevertheless, if we know more about it, it's always useful. It's always useful about how the language works and all this sort of thing as well. So it's a marvellous thing. I'm glad it's happening. And the, the use within this of um, you know, elements of AI-based analysis is actually a useful use of this. I, I've, I had one question about how does you know chat GTP help me as a historian. Um, I'm not sure I can do a full answer on that because it, I, I you know I, I can't imagine ever using anything like that. I can't see its usefulness for me. As a historian, you need to be able to look at the evidence you have and then you, you do bring something personal to it. You've got to try and decide what's important, what's jumping out, what are the patterns. I don't think in the state they are at the moment, and I suspect for a very long time, perhaps at all, that a machine can do that. Um, you know, it's more, more of an art than a science, it isn't precise. Um, and uh, so, it, whereas it might have a use in trying to decipher fragmentary sources like that, piece things together, reconstruct what the text is, once you get to the text, it's no longer of any use. Anyway, Herculaneum and a little bit about um, AI at the end, but the main thing is. This is good news, it's really exciting stuff. Any new discovery, whether it's through excavation or whatever, is, is always marvellous. It just adds to that sense of this lost world that we, we're trying to understand.